Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight to our public hearing. My name is Richard Stewart. Uh, on behalf of City Council, I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. This is a public hearing into the bylaws that will be introduced to you in a few moments by Deputy City Clerk. Council for City of Coquitlam has given first reading to these bylaws and has directed that a public hearing be held to get public opinion. Staff from the City's Planning and Development Department will present a summary of each proposed bylaw and the floor will be open to anyone in attendance that wishes to present his or her views on the proposed bylaws. Those that are pre-registered will be given first opportunity to speak. I stress to all of you that this is a public hearing. It's an opportunity for anyone who has a view on the proposed bylaw to make that view known to council members. Council members are here with an open mind and are here to listen to your input. No one has prejudged the outcome of these applications. Uh, we've given it first reading. We've essentially directed that a, a public hearing be held to get public opinion. But this is a public hearing. It's not a question and answer period. It's not an opportunity to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with either council members, with staff, or with anyone else in the audience who might be opposed to your particular point of view. So we ask that you restrict your comments to the proposed bylaw. You be as brief and concise as possible. We're asking speakers to respect the five minute time limit in order that everyone who wishes to speak is able to do so. You can speak as often as you want, five minutes each time, as long as it's new, and addition, uh, new or additional information. We ask the audience be respectful of each speaker and allow that speaker to complete his or her point without interruption. So that's no clapping, no booing, no cheering, any of the presentations made this evening. As chair of this hearing, I reserve the right to conclude any presentation that does not relate to the bylaw that becomes abusive or becomes repetitive of views that that speaker has already made known to council members. Please note that if you wish to provide a written uh, submission to be included in the public record of this meeting, you must hand in that submission to Ms. Lohr, the city, Deputy City Clerk, prior to the adjournment of the related item on that agenda. Please also note council cannot receive any information any additional information written or verbal after the adjournment of the public hearing and prior to consideration of the respective bylaws at the next council meeting. So immediately following the uh, adjournment of this public hearing tonight, we will have a regularly scheduled council meeting uh, to convene in order that council may give consideration to items on the public hearing agenda. If uh, a council member objects uh, to a, or doesn't want to consider any particular item because more information is needed or something like that, uh, we can defer uh, that item pending receipt of the requested information. I'll now call on Ms. Lohr to introduce the other bylaws on tonight's agenda and planning uh, agenda and planning and development staff to make a presentation on the first item. Thank you, Your Worship. Item one is an application to amend the land use designation and rezoning for 1100 Woolwood, Wool Ridge Street for bylaw numbers 4248 and 4249 2011. Good evening, Your Worship and Council Members. This site is located on the southeast corner of King Edward Street and Woolridge. The site is designated industrial in the official community plan. Zoning on the site is M1, general industrial. Zoning to the northwest and east is CS1, service commercial. The official community plan amending bylaw would redesignate the site to service commercial, and the zoning amending bylaw would rezone the site to CS1, service commercial. These proposed bylaw amendments would have, have been initiated as a result of the King Edward Street overpass project and Woolwich Street realignment. Staff are recommending second, second and third reading to bylaw numbers 42, 48, and 42, 49. Thank you very much. Are there any speakers to this item? Are there any speakers to this item? Second time, third time, are there any speakers to this item? That's the way it's done. Okay, seeing none, I'll declare this item adjourned. Item clerk. Item, item two is a rezoning application for the properties at 1267 Soval Street and 3446 Gislason Avenue, bylaw number 4247, 2011. Please pause for a moment, Councillor Asmundson. Thank you very much, this is a close proximity to home, so there's a perceived potential conflict, and I'll be stepping out on this item. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll invite Councillor Asmussen to come back after this item's over. 
go ahead. This subject site is located on the southeast corner of Gisasloan Avenue and Solball Street. The site is designated as small village, single family residential and street oriented village home in the official community plan. Zoning on the site and to the west, north and east is RS2 suburban residential. Zoning to the south, north and west is RS7 small village fa single family residential and to the west P5 special park and RS8 large village single family residential. The sites have one single family residence on each of the two lots. The applicant is seeking to rezone the site to facilitate a future street oriented village home and single family development under the RTM1 and RS7 zoning provision. Staff are recommending all second and third readings to bylaw number 4247. Thank you. If we kill Councillor Asmussen's microphone, please. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Second time. Are there any speakers to this item? Third and final time. Any speakers to this item? Seeing none, I declare this item declare this item adjourned. Just wait for Councillor Asmussen to return. Seems to go a lot faster when you're not here. <laughs> Ms. Clerk. Item three is an application to rezone the property at 1188 Pine Tree Way, bylaw number 4252-2011. The subject site is located on the west side of Pine Tree Way, south of Glen Drive in a sea of red. The site is designated as city center commercial in the official community plan. Zoning on the site and to the east is RS1, one family residential zoning to the north, west and south is C4 city center commercial. The applicant is seeking to rezone the site to C4 city center commercial to facilitate the future, a future mixed use high density development. Staff are recommending all final readings to bylaw number 4252. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? We do have a speakers list for this item. Oh, this is item, no. Okay. I don't have Mr. that. Mr. Ben oh. Craig. Go ahead and read that. Oh, sorry. We're on item three. Never mind. Got ahead of myself there. Sorry. So I was right and you were wrong. It happens when I flip the page ahead of time. <laughs> that never happens. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Are, there <laughs> Are there any speakers to this item? Second time, are there any speakers to this item? <coughs> Third and final time, any speakers to this item? Seeing none, declare this item adjourned. Now for item four. Item four is an application to rezone the properties at 626 and 630 Como Lake Avenue for bylaw number 4253-2011. Your hey, worship and members of council, my name is Michael Dollywall, development planner with the city. This site is located on Como Lake Avenue, east of Emerson Street and west of Dogwood Street. <clears throat> the site is designated medium density apartment in the official community plan. Zoning on the site is RT12 family residential. Zoning to the north, south, west and east is RT12 family residential. The applicant is seeking to rezone the site to RM3 multi-story apartment residential to accommodate the development of a four-story 42 unit building with underground parking access from the south lane. No proposed variances are associated with this project. Sorry. You can only do it when it's in the... Uh... Looks like a 10 story building. <laughs> Now you have to lean to the left, Councillor yeah. Sikora. <laughs> A four-story, 42-unit building with underground parking access from the south lane. No variances are proposed. Now that one. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the project is within 400 meters of the proposed Broquitlam Evergreen Station. Staff are recommending second and third readings to bylaw number 4253 2011. 
Thank you. Now, I understand there's a speaker's list on this. There is a speaker's list for this one. Yes, Ben Craig, please. Mr. Craig. Mr. Craig's address is 639 Elmwood. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, my name is Ben Craig. I'm uh, with the Oakdale Heritage Society. We're a nonprofit whose goal is to encourage community spirit, preserve our heritage, beautify the area, and represent Oakdale community in civic matters. Uh, the reason we're here tonight is because we see our neighborhood changing dramatically in the coming years. We see new developments both pro proposed and approved that will result in thousands of new residents to the Burquitlam area. We see family res single family residences being replaced by low rises to accommodate hundreds of new residences. Tonight's proposed development at 626, 630 Como Lake would uh, replace two homes with 42 homes. In the case of the Safeway parking lot, the Boza development, uh, 334 addresses will be added where there were none before. At the same time, we see little evidence of planned amenities to support these new residents. Amenities such as schools, community centers, youth centers, parks, a library. Now, uh, we appreciate that uh, this lack of amenities in the Burquitlam area has been acknowledged by council, but we came here today to get a be better understanding of the plans in place. We understand that a new Burquitlam neighborhood plan is in the works but won't be available for public scrutiny until 2013. Our fear is that based on the current torrid rate of development in our area, we'll see thousands of new residents in our community before a plan is in place to support them. As residents of Burquitlam, we want to offer our assistance in the decision-making process. More specifically, we want to go on record tonight to request that no new building permits be approved without a comprehensive plan in place to support our swelling population. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Are there any, that's the only one on the speaker's list, so are there any speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Thank you very much. I declare this item closed. Item 5 is an application to change the land use designation and rezone the properties at 3395, 3405, 3415, 3425 Highland Drive, and 1425, 1437, 1429 Coast Meridian Road, and 1430 Dayton Street. Bylaw numbers 4250 and 4251, 2011. Okay. The subject site is located on a number of consolidated properties bounded by Coast Meridian to the west, Highland Drive to the south, Devonshire Avenue to the north, and Dayton Street to the east. The site is currently designated as conventional townhomes, large village single family, and environmentally sensitive area in the official community plan. Zoning, to the, zoning on the site is RS2 one family suburban residential. Zoning to the north, is RS2 one family suburban residential and RS7 small village single family residential. Zoning to the south is RS2 one family suburban residential, RS7 small village single family and RS8 large village single family. Zoning to the west is RS8 large village single family and zoning to the east is RS7 small village single family. The official community plan amending bylaw would redesignate the site to conventional townhouse and rezone the site to RT2 Townhouse Residential and P5 Special Park. The applicant is proposing to develop 95 strata duplex units, and each unit would have two parking spaces, and access to the site is limited to Dayton Street and Devonshire Avenue. Staff are recommending second and third readings to bylaw 4250 and bylaw 4251-2011. Thank you very much. Uh, registered on the list is uh, Hugh Kerr and architect uh, with Polygon Development, the applicant. 
Are they here? There we go. 1133 West Broadway. Uh, your Worship, <laughs> members of council, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to uh, speak with you tonight. I, um, staff's done a great job through Land Use Committee outlining this project. I just wanted to touch base on a couple of, couple of uh, main points. Um, and just to say we have uh, some members of our consultant team here, the landscape architect and, uh, and our architect and our civil engineer just came in the door. So they're here to answer questions as well. Um, again, just to go over the, uh, the nature of, of, of the um, OCP amendment that we're considering, um, the two areas that are um, presently um, under uh, RSA uh, compromise about 30% of the site. And it's uh, worth noting that the area just to the north of our site is still zoned single family and there is a proposed single family subdivision uh, under, the, uh, under consideration there. Um, and I believe you should have a copy of this package, and I won't go, go through it, but oh, if I've had number, a number of meetings with the Ratepayers Association and local uh, residents, and initial concerns have been, uh, have been expressed, and we've addressed them in our, in our design. Um, just one thing to, to look at right away, if we look at a schematic site plan uh, under the existing neighborhood plan, you can see um, what we've done is shown the uh, RS8 development, uh, potential single family RS8 development in the bottom corner of the site and along Coast Meridian and then uh, the RT2 townhomes in the middle of the site. Uh, so under the existing neighborhood plan, one could have uh, 19 homes and possible secondary suites of 18% and that number comes from experience um, with Morningstar homes and what they're ex experiencing now in terms of people taking options on um, developing secondary suites. So that adds to about three secondary suites and 92 townhomes for a total number of homes of 114 at 14.2 units per acre. Uh, you could have driveways uh, all accessing down onto Highland Drive up to 11 buildings and eight feet between buildings. It's also worth noting that just in terms of the overall site, some real challenges to the extreme slope and the central habitat area. We have DFO approval for our uh, site planning um, to date. Our proposal is, um, in, in contrast, in the, in, the, in the sensitive corner, we have uh, five duplex uh, townhome buildings with 10 feet between the buildings, no driveways on Highland Drive, and also on Devonshire, it's essentially two-story duplexes facing Devonshire. It's also worth noting that we're increasing the amount of outdoor amenity uh, from f required 475 to about 1,000 square meters. So we have 95 uh, RT2 conventional townhomes all in a duplex form. And that's at 11.8 units per acre. It's also worth noting because we have side-by-side -side indoor parking garages per home, we have two uh, minimum two parking stalls per home versus a 1.5. So we have 203 parking stalls provided. That includes 13 on the apron for an increase of 60 parking stalls beyond what the bylaw requires. It's also worth noting that in our off-site design, there's the potential for on-site parking for 21 spots, or off-site I should say, on Highland, 10 off Dayton, and 31 off Devonshire. Now that's on, on, on one side of the road. And, that has to be reviewed with traffic, but the potential is there, and that's how the design works at this point. Um, I now turn it over to Rob Chicozzi, who's our project architect, who just have a few comments on the, uh, the nature of the design of the buildings. Your Worship, Council Members. Um, yes, sir. The, apart from the challenges that uh, Hugh mentioned of the, the, the physical grade and, and the sort of challenge with the creek setbacks. The biggest challenge for us architecturally was how to respond to the single family context, the immediate context around the site. And the approach we chose was to develop a series of uh, duplex units uh, in a single family massing. And even though the site uh, consists of, uh, is designated, of 70% of the site is de designated townhouse, we chose to carry this, this scale and massing throughout the site so really carry a single family massing through the site. And this streetscape along Devonshire here sort of reflects the, the, the types of units we're proposing. Um, and below there in the photograph is this typical uh, sort of duplex unit in the area. Um, 
what this what this image shows here is basically how we dealt with that uh, that single family massing and trying to break it down. One of the biggest uh, things we did was try taken the third story and pulled it back, as you can see here in this in this image here. What it does is pull back the third story and bring forward the two story. And what you see here on the view down Highland Drive was in the street stage, you can see how the two story mass does present itself to the street and the third story mass does pull back. Um, another advantage of this is, uh, as, as Hugh mentioned, is uh, it, it does away with any driveways and two car garages. All the access or vehicles are in, in, the, in the internal roads. Uh, so it really creates a very uh, sort of pedestrian friendly streetscape along the, uh, along the sidewalk there. Other, other ways of sort of breaking down the massing was using materials. Uh, it, on all the mostly exposed sides, we presented materials like stucco, uh, wood shingles, hardy plank, and, um, and used those materials with contrasting colors to really start to break down the massing. Um, and the other thing, given that the, the, the stepping nature of the site, we've, the roofs are stepping down, so it really, we're able to take, use that to our advantage to really try to step down the massing. And, and really try to present this, even though it's a duplex, try to present it as a single family. So we worked hard at trying to sort of play down the, the, the two entry sort of thing and try to really focus on the, on the elements. Uh, and, uh, we, we, and we tried to create some variety along the street as you would get if they were developed individually as single family homes. Uh, thank you. Give a really just a quick uh, conclusion. So the proposal is for less density that could be accommodated in the neighborhood plan. Massing and building forms materials that are sympathetic to single family neighborhood. Each home is to have a side by side enclosed parking for two cars and there's no driveways on the street. On site amenity is increased. There's a retention of the existing habitat area. Outdoor amenity space increased over the required and the duplex townhome format provides a unique housing form on Burke Mountain. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. I have one actually, not a question, but I would have preferred any of the elevations to include the parking face of the building, but we don't have any of those. Uh, Councillor Zakor had a question. Yes, thank you very much. Could you tell me what size are these units in square footage? The average size is uh, just under 2,100 square feet. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm almost afraid to ask the question because I suspect the answer is going to be so simple that. I wish I had no driveways on the street. No driveways on the street. I'm not clear what that means. How, well, how do you the, get to your driveway? Beg your pardon? How do you get uh, to they're your internal driveway? roads. There are two, <laughs> the they're, they're, roads? They're okay. two side access points. Sure. So that's where okay. the traffic comes in. So and off that, it's all internal. None off Coquitlam roads, all off internal yeah. roads. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> well, so, uh, I thought it was a very good question, Councillor Nicholson. <laughs> Any other questions from Council? No. Thank you very much. And that's the only uh, speaker registered, so are there any speakers to this item? Are there any speakers to this item? Please come forward, sir. You have to state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, David Menzies, and my address is 3481 Baycrest Avenue, Coquitlam. Um, I also own property adjacent to this particular project in question here. I don't have any uh, issues with the actual proposal itself, but I have a little bit of an issue with the uh, watercourse that travels through this land, that dissects this land from corner to corner. Now, the, I, I've, had, I've wrote, written it down here. Now, the watercourse uh, flowing through the project from northeast to southwest. Now, this watercourse was surveyed some five to seven years ago uh, and classified as non permanent, non fish bearing. That is to say, it flows less than six months of the year. Now, NCON was a survey company and identified the watercourse as tributary number four. Uh, it has been referred to as. Um, drainage, swale, those types of terms. Not a big major watercourse. Now it flows partially in a defined channel and mostly in an undefined channel. Upstream components have been relocated and culverted. And there is a proposal to culvert an additional, I'm assuming 30, 25, to, 25 to 30 meters additionally downstream. Now, 
this particular, uh, and also where it's going to be culverted, is also going to be designated a special park, uh, one on top of the other, very convenient. Now, this particular water course has been, <coughs> pardon me, by a QEP, has been determined environmentally sensitive. Now, my question, not, I, I don't, don't expect an answer, but my question is, how can a water course be designated as environmentally sensitive, dug up and culverted in a concrete culvert? That seems, I'll use the term counterintuitive to do something like that, to say it's environmentally sensitive, then you can go and dig it up and put it in a concrete pipe. Uh, also, uh, now, another question is, uh, actually, if, if actually, this sir, you, uh, sir, stream sir? can be... Sir, you are actually act asking questions. I wonder if you, you were interested in an answer. I don't know if anyone has oh, an I answer. didn't know this was a question and answer. It isn't really a question and answer, but if you're asking a clarifying question, okay. uh, like if you, we can okay. put, there may be an answer to that. I don't know whether, in fact, uh, we have a report that declares how one um, culverts a, or whether, in fact, the information that we've been presented is, is current. Uh, Your Worship, um, just some, some um, I guess, high-level information. Uh, we, we, ha we are aware of the applicant's discussion with the uh, uh, Department of Fisheries uh, through our uh, normal development review process. Uh, this is a, a protected water course. There is some components of it that um, are being open channel, and, and the applicant can actually uh, potentially show that, uh, what components are being left in open channel. Um, so there's a combination of some culverting, depending on, on the portions of the site, but the majority of the, uh, of the creek is being uh, uh, protected uh, through a, a very detailed process with the Department of Fisheries, and they, are, they have accepted the, uh, the current proposal. Um, uh, the applicant may have more detailed information on the components of the channel that would be open if the applicant or the, if the speaker is interested in that information. That uh, doesn't really say much, but uh, if a stream is classified as environmentally sensitive, how can you dig it up and put it in a concrete pipe? That doesn't make sense to me. And also, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kerr mentioned that DFO approved this. This isn't even DFO's jurisdiction, it's the provincial government's jurisdiction. So I question, who's approved this? That's another question that comes to mind. Who's going to um, tell DFO they don't have jurisdiction? <laughs> and who's going to tell DFO they don't have jurisdiction? Um, oh, I, I wouldn't mind doing that for one second. <laughs> I have, I have, uh, I have documents here. Uh, well, you're, it's true. You're hired. They've, they've even, uh, I even have documentation here that uh, that it's a British Columbia, the Canada British Columbia Fish Habitat Management Agreement between the federal government and the provincial government. And it clearly says here the provincial government is the authority having jurisdiction. I know. You know. Okay. So. Um, so on my other question is therefore if this can be, in, if it's environmentally sensitive and you can culvert part of it, why can't you culvert all of it? I know you're not going to answer my question, but... Uh, <coughs> but I have that, um, have to. <coughs> just that I don't feel that the, uh, <coughs> the one, one size fits all standard is, is blanketed over all of these, uh, all of these streams in Northeast Coquitlam. And one size fits all, and it just seems like developers can do what they please with these particular water courses. Now this water course also runs through part of my property as well. And, I have issues with it. I'd like to relocate it. I'd like to culvert it as well. If they can culvert it, why can't I culvert it? I might make an application to do that. I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, that's pretty well I have. To, I have no, uh, no issues with the development. I'm quite happy with it. But the water course has uh, been my little bugaboo. So I'll leave you with that. Well, the reason I didn't answer your question about the water course is it's not my jurisdiction either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whose it is. Exactly. It's just them whoever they are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? I think she's speaking. Yep, okay. Whoever you are, your name and address for the record. This is for the record, I'll give it to you.
Okay. Um, Sandra Marsden, 3420 Highland Drive on Burke Mountain. Um, I was hoping my, the lady sitting in front of me would speak ahead of me. That would save me having to do a lot of talking, but <laughs> here I am. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, I guess one of the things that, uh, there's a lot of good things that have been done with the developer in communicating with uh, the people, um, the residents. Um, Mr. Carr has put in a lot of time and made a lot of changes, dressing the massing on Highland Drive by, I think, 24, 25 foot setback, and then the 10 foot uh, third story being set back. These are all good things. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, but having said that, uh, there are a couple of things. Um, well, I'll also add on that the 2.5 times the amenity space is good. Um, but there's a couple of things that um, are a concern still to myself and, and some of my neighbors on Highland Drive. Uh, <clears throat> one is that uh, I, 13 units um, will have a pad for parking because the two, each, each, to, each uh, how about this, each du duplex will have a covered garage with two parking stalls. However, the pad which accesses their garages is too short for parking on. So, except for I understand 13 units, and I'm not clear if those were 13 units or 13 buildings. If they were 13 buildings, then it would be 26 units. Um, so that means uh, of the 90, uh, 95 approximately, um, there's going to be a whole lot of uh, places that will be probably using visitor parking or parking on, uh, hopefully, on the, and in front of their townhomes, not the residences, on the west side of Dayton and the north side of Highland Drive. And of course, that's one of the uh, items that the residents on Highland Drive have asked for, is that uh, the ditch be cul culverted uh, so that there could be a parking lane. Uh, and that only is going to happen, I understand, uh, with DFO approval for the part above where the creek hit, goes into the ditch further down Highland Drive. <clears throat> so uh, what our concern with the parking pads is um, it would be nice if they could be a little longer because these, ho these townhomes are going to be three and four bedrooms with maybe an extra um, uh, office space or something like that. That's my understanding. So that's a lot of future kids with cars. And even if we don't go that route, uh, there are going to be uh, vans, I would think. And so maybe a van and uh, for driving the kids around and a commuter, commuter car for going to work. So, and then so that's assuming that the kids are little. But if there are people that are moving in there that have older kids, then there could be as many as four cars. So having the uh, I an increased uh, length, I guess, on the pad would take four cars rather than just the two in the garage. And then the visitor spaces could be left for the visitors. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. Um, hopefully this would happen without lo losing any private amenity space because they've been very generous with it. And it could happen without the uh, setbacks being reduced on Highland Drive because they've been very generous with that too, to avoid the massing. So that's one concern. Uh, the second concern uh, is if uh, we've been told by the developer that uh, phase two, which is the east side of the development, triangular development, too bad we couldn't have the map up there, it'd be easy to point it out and you could see it. But the east side of the um, uh, development uh, bordered by Dayton and Highland. Uh, is helpful. That, that is going to be a challenge for them to develop. And I guess our concern is that we are willing to support the development as, as, as it has been progressing, uh, but we're giving up RS2, RS8 homes across the street. And, and the massing's the same, uh, whether we have 4,800, it's going to be 4,800 uh, square feet across the street from me, whether it's a single family RS8 or whether it's a two-family duplex. So 
that doesn't matter to us. But if the developer decides for some reason, after they work on phase one, which is the larger area, which is to the west of the Diagonal Creek going through the property, if they decide that they don't want to develop phase two for some whatever reason, our concern is that we've worked very closely with the developer uh, and, and it will then be RT2 and we could end up with eight townhomes, series of eight townhomes across the street looking quite different. So we would like a covenant put on phase two that, uh, that if the developer sells that property that it would be specific for RT2 duplexes but ideally, we'd like it to revert to RS8, the, ori the, original, um, the original zoning. So we're kind of putting a lot of faith in our developer, on the developer polygon, that they are going to follow through on the entire development. And as I say, um, Mr. Carr has spent hours and hours with us and the ratepayers going over all of these things. So except for those two items, uh, and oh, and the other, the other one is that uh, we were hoping there would be no parking on the south side of Highland, which is in front of our homes. I think people in duplexes, townhomes, have every right to park in front of their own homes, but I don't think they should be parking in front of our homes. We supply parking on our property. Um, I, I, they park in my driveway or in my pad, so that would be something we'd want. Thank you. Now, I'd like to change hats Ms. and Mar maybe buy another five Ms. minutes. Ms. Marson? <coughs> I'd like to... Uh, Ms. Marson, um, you, 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 I've given you an extra minute and a half. Um, I wonder if you could... Um, there may be other people who want to speak to this item. Okay. And, uh, then I can, can come back because I have a letter from yep. two of my neighbors In on fact, you might be right back up. I don't know if there's anyone else. But okay. We do have to try, sure, try to maintain fair. the five minute thing. Yeah, no problem. First of all, although I'm glad Councillor Reed has a question for somebody. Yeah, I, I would like Mr. McIntyre to respond to um, Sandra's last question about phase, the phasing. Okay, Raul, sorry. Yes, um, no problem. Uh, your and worship. the process that would be involved. Yes, uh, the, the, um, the, the, what's currently before council are the bylaws for the, um, the OCP amendment and the rezoning. Of course, there will be a development permit that will eventually have to come forward with the detailed design. But the developer, um, has committed to a restrictive covenant on the property already to ensure that there are du uh, two unit blocks, if you will, we'll call them duplexes, essentially uh, the format before us today. So they've already committed to that. Um, in the event that for some reason there's some challenges, um, the city would be in a position to, to, to discuss that with the developer at that time. It would have to go through a public process, but we're confident that uh, Polygon uh, would follow their commitments. Uh, they've proceeded very far with this proposal and we're confident they will uh, completed as uh, as presented, but that covenant is going to be secured as part of this this development. Does that help? That that does. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Although welcome. still in our little minds, because we've all been discussing this as neighbors. Broaden your horizons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in our little minds, we're kind of going well. You know, we really like the look of these duplexes that they're going to put on Highland Drive. Um, I even if they did revert to somebody else, uh, would would they spend the same amount of time going through the same thing with us? Who knows? But um, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Would you like to come back? Oh, please. There we go. for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Carla Wilson and I live at, um, on the property at 1450 Dayton Avenue. And um, I'm kind of reiterating what Sandra had said, that I have a concern pertaining to the parking as well. I know they've met the parameters of the city's requirement, but due to the fact that these are starting at three bedroom and going up to four bedroom plus den, I'm feeling there's going to be a huge parking issue. Sorry. And I per Sorry, you live on the property or you live north of the property? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm right now I am on the property and I've purchased on Dayton, so I'm moving oh, four it. doors away, oh, so both okay. times it's going to pertain okay. to me, I guess. Thank you. And um, what I'm seeing as a problem is that these are larger units and because they're only a two garage allowing for parking, except for 13 units, I, I assume, are, are having a driveway for 
um, parking, and they're going to be family units. So I'm picturing families with bicycles and all the toys that kids have, and I don't know who has a two-car garage that can actually fit two vehicles in it. That's not something that you see very often. So I'm seeing, you know, a four-bedroom and a den with only a garage to supply enough parking for that entire family is going to have a huge community setback. It'll be a problem in the long term. And um, there isn't a map up here, but up to the top, there were, I believe, six units along the side and, and four coming off to the left off the street. And with those 10 homes, there are two parking spots. And I guess that is the city requirement, point two. But when you look at how many homes there are, there are four bedrooms and then three bedroom plus den and two tiny parking spots that are allowed for visitors, I know the overflow, the, hu the community around is going to feel it especially when it comes to weekends and entertaining times, and I wish the city would consider um, requiring more, not just for this project, for all projects townhouse-based. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, on that point, um, the parking pad, or the driveway, how I see typical driveways that seem long enough for a, a conventional car. Is that the case, or...? I, I, um, Your Worship, uh, that depends on the availability of space within the project. Uh, developers do try and make those pads, speaking to the developers, they try and make those pads big enough to actually have additional overflow parking for those units. In this case, there is not. Th there are pads in front of the units, but the majority of them are not sufficient depth to be accommodated, to accommodate an actual physical car. So the developer has rightfully shown only 13 additional stalls. Mm -hmm. uh, someone with a, a mini or a Prius or something maybe it'll squeeze in but uh, I think the developer has rightfully shown the the appropriate um, aprons that can accommodate stalls um, uh, there are as the speaker just mentioned um, additional I think 18 or 19 visitor stalls as well so there's the, the two different precincts north and south of the creek each have a fair amount of additional visitor stalls um, shown on the on the plan and this room for council and it's room for Councillor Robinson's Mini and my Prius. Good. Okay. Okay. Any other speakers? Any other speakers to this item? Please come forward, sir. And Sandra, don't worry. When I get to third, third call, I'll. <laughs> I won't try and slip it through on you. <laughs> Until you're almost done, right? Sorry, I'm. I'm new at this. I've never been through this process before. Don't worry so. at all. So correct me. Your name and address for the record, and then you're on. Okay. 3396 Horizon Drive, and uh, we're one of the uh, <coughs> new owners in the uh, houses on Horizon Drive there. And your and, name? Um, <coughs> and yeah, your no, name? I've, we've and been your name? Oh, Trevor Sinclair. Correct. Yeah. So we've been uh, following this process, and you know, we've with a lot of interest. Um, on our street, our street is very narrow. We already foresee a lot of parking problems on our street. Um, and I know some of the houses have legal suites approved already, so it's going to—it's already a parking issue. Um, <clears throat> so my concern was I met with Hugh. He did a presentation. It was uh, we, we had a good chat, and um, <clears throat> you know I, I think uh, personally I like the development. I, I think it's it's good to have a developer that will do a good job in the development, and I you know I support that. Um, <clears throat> my concern is and I. <laughs> Being an accountant, I know how some of these developments work. They they try and expand, 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 and I guess my concern is is uh, uh, <clears throat> the land behind us uh, to the north of, de of the development. Is there any any way that we can get a covenant to uh, restrict further development or expansion of this development? Mr. Alueva will be demonstrating something, I think. I just I wanted to show, this is the, um, I can switch. This is the application that came before us uh, today at the committee. Oh. Okay. Yep. We'll go old school again with this, the projection. Um, I just wanted to show, um, uh, this is the Ryan Drive, this mm -hmm. is the application here. So this project is before committee today. Okay, okay. Um, uh, committee did forward that to council, uh, to, so it should come not this Monday coming up, but the following one, or bylaws for rezoning. So there okay. is already an intent. Um, in terms of like, the actual process that would drive this, the applicant for that site has to go through a rezoning process. So 
-hmm. It's that process that yeah. provides the land use. I wonder, were, were that not to be I wonder if you could take the microphone oh, for, the, oh, for the people at home. Yeah, so were that process not to be successful, the land would remain zoned um, large, large lot, single family. So right. in, uh, for someone to, to try and do townhousing, which is your concern, they'd right. have to come in through a rezoning process. So yeah. uh, at this point, we're, we're quite comfortable that this is the land use that's been uh, proposed, and that will be going through bylaws uh, in the next few weeks. Okay. Okay, why don't we leave that map up there? I think Councillor Reed has some explanation related. Well, I just want to comment that um, suites have to provide on site parking. And so if you feel that the roads are clogged up because people have suites, um, we have bylaws that will look after that in a hurry, and maybe that's the way you need to, to go and start making sure that people who have suites are parking on site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be parking on the streets. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure why the road was so narrow. Like Horizon Drive was a very narrow road. That's engineering. I'm land use. We do everything right engineering. Not okay. so much. <laughs> Who's engineering? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not only that, but land use has public hearings. Engineering doesn't want to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. perhaps we could ask our engineer. Oh, they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my question is, is should this deal fall through where um, I understand that they have an option to to uh, buy this land and develop it for a single family, and should that option not be exercised, uh, that land would become possibly become available again. So, what what guarantee do we have that this project wouldn't be expanded? I guess is my concern. Is there? Hmm. Uh, we're, the, the 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 current application that uh, was viewed by committee today is to rezone the property. This property. Uh, behind you from RS2 to a combination of RS8 and RS7, which is in compliance with the official community plan. Okay. Uh, the staff have supported it because it is in compliance with the official community plan. Yeah. Were this application not to be successful and someone pick up the property, try and do something other than that, yeah. they would need an official community plan amendment. Yeah. Uh, that notification would be sent to your neighbors and all the property owners surrounding it, mm -hmm. and they would have to demonstrate to this council and sure. certainly to staff. Yeah. And, and that process is pretty rigorous. And Polygon has no intention of, of no. expanding. As expense. far as I know, this is a different developer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Apart from Sandra, are there any other speakers to this item? <laughs> Seeing none, I declare Sandra the next speaker. But it's not Sandra who's going to um, give this information. It's from uh, Rick and Janet Klopp and Sylvia Minthorn on Highland Drive. I'm just reading it. Um, so uh, here we go. Regarding the application by Polygon Developments to amend the OCP plan, uh, changing the nor zoning of their property bordered by Coast Meridian and Highland Drive, Dayton and Derbyshire Avenue. The fact remains that Burke Mountain is 265 conventional townhome units over the proposed density for the area. Polygon's proposal for the development of 95 strata duplex units on their site seems to be the lesser of the evils presented to us, but we still have concerns about the lack of parking. People use their garages for storage, not for parking their cars. These duplex units are big enough with four bedrooms to conceivably be occupied by families of four or five people. We know that as children come of age, they procure their driver licenses in their own vehicles. They also live at home longer due to furthering their education and the cost of living. It cannot be assumed that the buyers for Polygon's proposed units will be young families who will move on, empty nesters or single people. The units are going to be a considerable investment and we think it highly unlikely residents will invest up, more likely they'll stay put. In a perfect world, it would be wonderful to be thinking green by limiting people's access to only two vehicles per unit. But we still have no easy accessible transit in this area or any hope of getting transit to Highland Drive or northward in the near future. Really, what is Coquitlam thinking? We were promised transit for allowing Westwood Plateau to go ahead decades ago. Transit does not expand to serve areas as they build up or adjust the two changes in transportation routes to make it more efficient. 
regardless of any standard amount of parking required for this type of development in the rest of Coquitlam, it is not unreasonable to request more parking spaces for this site. We have tried to make it clear, Burke Mountain is not like the rest of Coquitlam because we have no transit. Um, for example, Transit does not use the David Connector uh, or above it anyway. Klopp daughters gave up on using Transit to Douglas College. They could walk faster. Our other concern is that Polygon follow through with the plans they have presented for this rezoning, particularly regarding Phase 2, which directly affects us. They have said themselves that Phase 2 will be more problematic than Phase 1. It is our desire, like Grenbrook, to preserve some of the character of our neighborhood. Once we have agreed to let Polygon change the zoning from RS8 to RT2 conventional townhomes, what is to prevent them from changing their mind about proceeding with phase two and selling it to another developer who will rub their hands in glee at the prospect of building higher density townhomes? If Polygon should sell off their proposed phase two, the lower, more challenging southeast corner, we insist that the zoning revert to the original zoning, RS7 uh, or RS8 in the OCP. This is fair and reasonable. We residents have had enough experience with developers finessing their changes to their advantage that we now insist that council support our interests and require that rezoning changes be allowed only for the developments presented and approved or the companies risk forfeiture of the decision. And zoning will revert to the original OCP designation before any sale can take place. Thanks. Um, I just have one comment. If, as <coughs> Councillor Reed said, uh, single family homes with a possibility of a basement suite need to have, uh, and that's any size, need to have parking on their pads as well as in their garages, then I think the same should hold true for strata developments. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Tsakora has it. Yeah, thank you. To the planning department, <coughs> we're looking at this <coughs> rezoning the whole package, right? And if, let's say, that Polygon built half, another half, they wanted to dispose of it for somebody else, then if there was a change in, in land designation, there would have to be another public hearing. Am I correct? Your Worship, that is correct. Uh, a change in the land use designation and the zoning would require a new public hearing. Okay. okay, thank you. And there's a covenant on it. Okay. And that may be it. Are there, I'll do the three readings. Are there any further speakers to this item? Are there any further speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any further speakers to this item? Seeing none, I declare this item closed. Madam Kirk. Item 6 is an application to amend the zoning for the property located at 2080 United Boulevard, bylaw number 4259-2011. The subject site is located south of the Trans-Canada Highway between Schooner Street and Fawcett Road. The site is currently designated general commercial and official community plan. The sites to the north and west are zoned M8 retail and light industrial. Zoning to the south is M9 light industrial and zoning to the east is M1 general industrial. The applicant is requesting to amend the C6 casino commercial zone to expand the permitted uses to include tourist accommodation and cabaret limited to nightclub or bar. In addition, the zone would also be amended to permit outdoor seasonable, seasonal seating, increase the maximum density from 0 0.39 times the lot area to 1.0 times the lot area, increase the maximum lot coverage from 25% to 60%, and increase the maximum height from 7.6 meters to 55 meters. The proposed, the proposed amendments to the zone would accommodate the upside down again. The proposed amendments to the zone would accommodate the development of a new cafe, banquet, and conference space, and an 11-story, 181-room hotel, and modification to the existing restaurant. 
Staff are recommending second and third readings to bylaw number 4259-2011. I have a question. Okay. So I. We, we have two questions coming from staff, or from council, rather, Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much uh, to the staff. Uh, I was told that there was not going to be any cabaret in this hotel. And now, all of a sudden, the cabaret is popping up again? Is that a fact? It's under C6. Mr. Alweber or Mr. Dalliwell? Oh, yes, Dalliwell. Um, Your Worship, um, at this time, the, um, the Great Canadian um, is not intending to have a licensed facility. Uh, however, they have um, indicated through the application that they, they are uh, putting a, uh, a space within the uh, facility that's considered a lounge. And that lounge is ultimately depending on the needs of the facility, and they do intend it to be a full-service facility. Uh, they would be looking for the potential in the future to have a licensed facility. If that were the case, they would bring forward a request for a liquor primary license through this council. Um, and so that would be a subsequent um, uh, process they would go through. Uh, it, and it is part of their, um, their, their program uh, for full service in terms of the entire uh, casino and, 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 and gaming facility. Um, the, the proponents will be explaining that uh, component uh, to council as part of their presentation. Yeah, uh, the, the, the fact that I'm saying this because I know that they said that there'd be no cabaret in this, uh, in this a hotel. Now all of a sudden there's a, a cabaret. What else is going to come aboard? That's what I'm concerned about. Okay. Thank and you. Councillor Zagora is specific to the word, I believe he's being specific to the word cabaret, um, and not because there was a lounge, I, there was the word lounge was used in a previous a cabaret, discussion yeah. related to this and the original one had cabaret and that was and a, a cabaret. Okay. And, and a cabaret. <laughs> okay. I'm glad I explained it. Okay. Councillor Reed. Um, do you have the amount of additional convention space? It's the convention space I'm, I'm thinking it's around 12,000 additional square feet. I think I'm pretty close. Can you just confirm that because that's the important part here. Okay, um, Your Worship, um, uh, just to I'll run through some of the additional square footage um, that's proposed under this, uh, this amendment. Uh, currently, there's a restaurant right now that's about 4,800 square feet. Uh, we'll, that it is going to be added to, and that will be uh, um, uh, 5,800 square feet. Um, no change to the theater. Uh, there's going to be an addition uh, of a cafe that will be about 2,600 square feet. Conference and banquet facility that's going to be added is 7,400 square feet. Um, the hotel, 181 rooms, uh, total of 123,000 square feet, roughly, and the, the lounge uh, would be around 4,700 square feet were that to come to fruition. Okay, so where's the 12,000 square feet? Or I'll wait till the applicant speaks. That's what I want to hear. Thank you. Okay. No other, no other questions from council? We'll go straight through the... I'll wait. Well, there weren't any. Okay, you just added one. Sorry. I just added Councilor one. Robin. I did add one because okay. I, I was hoping that uh, staff were going to say something about parking in terms of um, meeting the requirements for parking. If you could also just speak to that for just a, a moment, be yes. clear on that. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, um, the proposed additions and the existing space on the site uh, would require a total of 1,592, so 1,592 parking stalls. The, cur the proposal before us um, is to provide 1,784 parking stalls, which is a surplus of 192 stalls. Thank you. Okay, are there any other council speakers? Seeing none. And on the list, uh, beginning is the applicant, Howard Blank, Great Canadian Casinos, 13775, Commerce, Commerce Parkway in Richmond. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, I thought it best I'd go through some points regarding our proposal, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Also, our architect, um, Mike Alavoidovich, is here with me as well, as members and also members of our executive team on the project. Um, with regards to our hotel issues that were brought up, um, if we're going to compare towards River Rock, because River Rock uh, had 191 uh, uh, hotel rooms plus the new hotel that just opened, our rev par and ADR, which is average uh, daily rate, rank number one and number two in Richmond consistently. We've never fallen below that. There were a lot of questions that we'd be trying to undercut. In fact, we're only number two sometimes because of the four diamond Fairmont Hotel at the airport 
uh, sometimes beats us, but generally we're number one. Our price point is planned for a resort style property and not a reasonable hotel or motel property. There is a fair market price for the convenience and use of the four diamond amenities while staying on property. Similar to that if you find amusement parks, if you're going to stay on the hotel at the amusement park, you're going to pay a fair price as opposed to going further away and shuttling in. Smaller hotels and inns see guests use their properties and shuttle to River Rock, as I just said, in Richmond. Currently, we have many uh, large acts that come to the Red, and also a number of acts you folks probably wouldn't have known that do not play there. Simple fact is, they need a Four Diamond Hotel, and they do not want to shuttle in 45 minutes, and so we've missed some of the big stars that we hope to be able to attract by having them right on property. There's also the wow factor to see those people roaming around the property. That River Rock has made its name for itself. Our project will create between 110 and 140 full-time construction jobs and over 230 full and 50 part-time jobs at the new hotel, resort, convention and food and beverage facilities. We have been a boom to Boulevard area. Currently, if you look and see over the years since we first built, the Wendy's and Tim Hortons are considered number tops in BC for traffic, for their volume. The White Spot is about to open up a triple O's right across the street from us. And with the exception of the current highway development problems, uh, the boulevard area has been a boon to all retail. We care about the communities in which we serve and uh, there are a number of organizations that have currently used Boulevard and the Red Robinson Show Theatre for their events, starting with Share Family Services. We're known for the Variety Show of Hearts Telethon for a number of years, Crossroads Hospice, the Tri-City Night of a Thousand Stars, uh, the City of Coquitlam, your volunteer celebration, Bongra Idol, of the Gujwardi Society, Sprottshaw Community College graduations. We even have high school graduations take place in our theater from Samuel Robinson in Westview. And also Aboriginal education ceremonies, the Wharton events, which is ballet and school and dance events for children. And some of the more fun things we've known of, the Taste of the Tri-Cities trade show. General Motors unveils their cars there a number of years in a row. Our Boulevard 500 is a staple to the city and the community. The Greater Vancouver Home Builders Association chose us to do their um, EPTEC trade show. In fact, when we talked about the hotel, they were excited because so many of these events would like people to be able to stay on property and turn them as opposed to a six-hour event into a two-day or three-day convention. Many come and go to River Rock, in fact, because of our lack of hotel space, as we have a salesperson dedicated for Coquitlam, and sometimes we lose them to our other property. It does stay in our family, but obviously we'd love them to be out here. Last year we brought the prices right, which was, was one of the first uh, highly visible game shows to British Columbia, and we know the hotels in the surrounding area had people because we had people travel throughout British Columbia to come, both at River Rock and here at the Red Robinson Show Theatre. What we found when we were going through this proposal is our guests want more offerings, and this proposal will provide them with that. Mr. Sakura, uh, with regards to the cabaret, we currently have a cabaret on property. It's called the Lion's Den. There's dancing, there's live music, and there's food and beverage, and uh, we've never had any problems with that. When we're talking about additional uh, lounge space, basically restaurants that can convert into lounge area later at night, we can offer more music and bands, and also an accoutrement to our current uh, Red Robinson Show Theatre. We have crush space where people want to put on events and uh, functions pre and post our shows. We have a beautiful lobby, but we're hoping to be able to expend the, extend that over towards where the, trade, where the convention center will be built. We'd like to add the entertainment by having even more offerings on our property. Four-star convenience, putting in a four-diamond hotel will be the first in the city of Coquitlam. Meeting and convention space we feel is very important. We wouldn't be building this if we didn't know we could fill, the, fill it with the occupancy because there's a large cost to do a development, de development like this and we believe that uh, it will immediately be a benefit not only for us as a publicly traded company but also for the many organizations and groups that will decide to keep their events here in this city. We're anchored currently by the famous Red Robinson, Red Robinson Show Theatre. I think if you ask anyone, they know that that theatre exists here in Coquitlam. We're very proud of it. Little things that come with a hotel that people might not think of, such as valet. We have to have valet for our guests that would pull in under the port cashier. We need to have outstanding concierge service. Currently we have guest service, but imagine concierge service who are professionals that can basically handle from A to Z on everything a guest wants and also promote this city. Our sister property to River Rock and part of our world-class family of entertainment offerings, this new project will be in line as our flagship uh, destination property in British Columbia, as River Rock currently is. We're a proud community partner and a vibrant entertainment and convention destination. That's what our proposal wants to be. 
The City of Coquitlam will be proud of this Four Diamond Entertainment Facility just as the City of Richmond has embraced River Rock as its own. Hundreds of events take place there every year. Our company also looked at this option for many years, as you know, and we feel that now is the time to present this for your approval. We value our relationship with the citizens and City of Coquitlam. We're a proud community supporter, and if I may be so bold, say we're a corporate leader. Our company is to turn 30 years old in just a few months. We're very proud of everything we've done in this province. We are experts in gaming, hospitality, and this new addition will solidify our Coquitlam property as a must-see facility. This is a $50 million project that will help boost the local economy during definite slowdown. Great Canadian does deliver upon its promises. I think you just have to look at our track record. A um, couple other things that were important. There's the 9,000 square feet of convention space, as you folks were inquiring about. There's also over 3,000 of crush pre-space, which would be used for trade shows and other events. So it does bring us to 12,000 feet, plus the theatre. What we're basically having is a seamless flow. As soon as you enter the hotel and you will turn left, you're going to go into full convention meeting where they, where there be breakout rooms or they open all the way up and you can seamlessly go right into the theater without realizing you're all part of one giant convention or event. Um, and uh, that is it from me at this point. I'd like to ask Mike to come up and say a few things as our architect and then we can answer questions if you'd like. Well, okay. Sorry, Councillor Sikor has a question for you, uh, Sorry. Howard. And we'll okay, a couple things. Your rack room rates, what are they going to be at, roughly? Well, roughly, uh, probably uh, between 169 and 269, somewhere in that range, depending mm -hmm. on what room you get. Currently at River Rock, I think our, our average daily rate is in the 170, 180 range. Well, 175 in there, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, are you going to change your rates from the peak season to non-off peak season? Well, in our business, we're sort of the opposite of what you think of normal hotels. Yeah. Most hotels are always trying to get people there on the weekends. We're packed on weekends and midweek. Because we have this convention and the, and the Red Robinson Show Theatre, we've been able to build up what normally for resort property would be midweek lulls into uh, powerful uh, bookings. So okay. I don't, we're, we're not going to be trying to cannibalize the industry. If okay. you're going to stay at Disneyland, you're going to pay the price to be at Disneyland. Yeah, and, and one last question. You're going to have comp rooms like Las Vegas does? No, uh, I should say we may have the odd comp room. I can tell you River Rock, I can tell you River Rock, our comp rooms are probably under 1%. Same with our comp theater tickets where Vegas is, you know, 40 or 60%. Our comping is very low, and that's also because of the model that we operate in this province. We don't have the marketing room that we could as if we were receiving 90% of the profits in in the data. That's all the questions I have. Thank so you. you'll, you'll have to pay. Councillor Reed, did you have your question answered? I'm just trying to keep people on. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the jury's out on whether I you're... I think all those okay. are very fair questions. Sir, go ahead. Your Worship, members of council, my name is Mike Kalavojvodik. I have the privilege of being the project architect for this uh, facility. Um, Most of you are familiar with the campus, so I just want to point oh, I could use the, mouse. Um, the existing restaurant is right where the mouse is, along with the original access point to the very original casino portion, which is in that zone. We're proposing to construct our new development or the expansion in this zone. Uh, currently, the other thing that we're proposing in terms of access is to relocate this current access, which is very close to the building, and go into the parkade. And we're proposing to move it further west along United. Um, this is our proposed site plan. So really what we have is a fairly large podium, a hotel component that straddles part of the podium and links uh, the whole development together. The proposed new access off of United, what we've done is made the ability to go from United right into the parking structure. In so doing, we've tried to create a, a very nice and a bit of a, a sense of arrival to the site. We also have the ability to loop around and do the formal drop off and then people can either leave or carry on back into the parkade. We have managed to salvage a bit of surface parking. Uh, we've uh, as well in, uh, beautified the site, as you can see from uh, our landscape drawings. 
uh, what we're proposing to do in terms of the, um, as United gets expanded, we're a little bit pinched along that portion. So what we've tried to do is create a buffer, a landscape buffer, but also have the ability where people can go out of the building and use some of the plazas in front of the facilities. Uh, as you can see, the tree-lined street, uh, some water features, and I'll show you in a moment some of the sense of arrival at the facility. Um, on the roof area, we have the ability to, and we fully hope to take advantage of using this as a patio. Eventually, the lounge cabaret may end up going in here. It's a bit of a beacon and an architectural element from an aesthetic perspective from the outside. But really, the deck is meant to link the theater on the upper floor as well as the hotel and have a multi-use opportunities, whether it's uh, just a nice passive space or uh, you can, you know, many number of uses that you can envision. Uh, to the right of the image are a variety of treatments that we propose uh, to use on the site. Uh, all a little more modern, a little more urban uh, thing, using water to mask noise. Um, again, beautiful landscaping. We're doing some green initiatives uh, rather than doing a green roof. We're doing a water detention on the second floor where it has a similar concept as that, but it's aesthetic from a different perspective. We're going to explore notions of herb gardens and things of that nature for the restaurant. Um, here's the general setup. Hopefully it's easy for you guys to, to read, but uh, answering the original question that somebody had in terms of the conference space, I don't really see this as a convention space. Convention spaces are downtown Vancouver and much bigger entities. This is what I'll call a very large conference space. Once you include the casino, as well as the additional space that we're providing, there's the ability to have a 6,000 square foot area on one side that could be subdivided into three smaller spaces of 2,000 square feet each. On the street side, we are, um, have another space that's approximately 3,000 square feet that could be further subdivided. Um, when Raul mentioned, the overall uh, areas, that was really the new net increase. So if you guys remember the original slide, there was uh, an existing restaurant and some of the other casino components that we're gonna be demolishing. So uh, what we were trying to demonstrate from a parking count perspective is the net gain, so to speak, of area, but the actual square footage is 9,000 square feet net, plus all the crush space and uh, uh, kind of back of house space plus the pre-function space, which is probably in excess of 12,000 square feet. Um, in addition, on the ground floor, there's a restaurant, obviously a nice new entry as you come in. And the biggest purpose of the ground space is to link the current casino with the theater. That's one thing that the site currently misses and lacks. And this is kind of the, the final element to that. On the second floor are the support uh, components, pool, spa, um, fitness, and back of house components. So there's a, we've tried to create a separation of public and private spaces or service spaces. Uh, we have 24 rooms per floor on a typical floor, and we have suites on the upper floors. This is a sense, uh, our interpretation or rendering, what it would feel like in uh, when you arrive at the drop-off. Uh, it's a tight site, so we've used the underside of the uh, hotel component to act as our port cochere. Um, the portion that you see above you is going to be a spa component. We've got things like water features and things of that nature. On the second floor, the, this is our uh, interpretation of what it would look like uh, for the patio and kind of private and or large gathering spaces uh, in the open. Um, we've also done some view analyses from different vantage points. So we've taken a couple of views what it would look like going along the highway, looking at our facility. So one, two, and three, and then the one back at Hartley and uh, Schooner as well. So this is looking at, uh, at it from the freeway. And this has just gone on to Google and superimposed our images on there. 
This is looking at it from the other direction. And this is from back of Schooner. Uh, immediately, back of Hartley, you can't see our building. The parkade blocks it in its entirety. Um, it's a, it's deemed as a high rise, but really it's a good mid-rise height. It's 11 stories. It's not a huge imposing structure. We think it's contemporary. Uh, we've tried to use uh, materials such as stone um, through landscaping and stuff on the ground floor. And then on the upper portion, we've uh, integrated a lot of glass, modern features. We really want this to be the gateway into Coquitlam once you come off of Portman or leaving Coquitlam. So some of our signage indicates something that's visible from the highway, both the building and signage. Something that's visible closer as you get closer to the site and then if you look carefully there's even incorporation of additional signage that leads you into the site and into the facility. That's all I have. If you have any questions. There's one now. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Probably for Howard, I think. Uh, you quoted uh, numbers of jobs as, I think, 230 full-time, 50 part-time. Yes, sir. That's not the same as your letter says or as the analysis that's presented. In the, I'm not sure whether this table is part of the PKF letter or whether it came from you separately. But it says 206 full-time, 30 part-time. I'm just curious as to oh. how the numbers come to be different. Well, roughly 10% is management that would be added in. Uh, also, we've also taken the fact that uh, we will need more staff in our current existing facilities, such as restaurants, theater, etc., that will be over and above those that are just dedicated towards the hotel function. Towards the hotel operation? Yeah. Okay, and the second one is... Uh, when this came to us for first reading and, and referral to this public hearing, there was reference in the report to having had uh, a market analysis done sometime previously, when you previously came forward with a proposal for a hotel project on the site. Yes, sir. And at that time, I asked, and I think others did, the world has changed over those years, and have you not updated that study? I believe we have. We now have a letter from PKF that yes. says they did the study back in February. Uh, it's not particularly informative as to it. It says the results were positive. That's, uh, that, that's about as far as it yeah, goes. Uh, I'm interested yeah, PKF in, is here to speak, sir. Uh, well, I wasn't finished. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So I guess my first question is if, if you had done the study back in February, I don't understand why it wasn't put forward to us when this first came to us, instead of resulting from our asking for it. And then the second one is, can, can, we be a, can we be a little more specific about the results of the study? Because to add a hotel to our mix in the city, if it's marginally economically viable, is quite a bit different from something that stands on its own and will attract new business to our city. Makes, makes a significant difference to those who already exist in our city. Start with your second question first, okay. uh, and I'll have PKF come up and speak. Sure. Personally, on behalf of our executive, we would not do a project that's marginally successful. Our board would never allow that to go through. Uh, we have to do our ROI analysis, and we have to be very diligent in all aspects of the project in order for us to be able to present something of this nature. So this would not be a marginally successful project. Uh, based on all of our due diligence. But to that point, I'd ask PKF if they would come forward. They could answer the, speak a little more on that. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Beth Walters. I'm the owner of PKF Consulting in Canada. I have two, part, two fellow directors. Um, I live in Vancouver, and we uh, have a major database on the hotel industry in Canada. We um, show the, off the performance of hotels of about 222,000 hotel rooms in Canada each month. We've prepared that report for about 30 years. We see the financial statements for many of the hotels across Canada, a huge percentage. 
And I've worked on projects to do either valuations and, and all sorts of studies for most of the hotels within the region. So you have some questions? Okay. Well, I think I did express the question. So, would you like to know? Which is, in the work that you did, are you a, were you able to identify the source of the business that will be attracted to this new hotel? Is it business that would not otherwise be coming to our city? Or is it business that will be attracted from elsewhere in our city? It's a combination. Or is it, and it's if, a combination. If, if it's a mix, can you give me some idea what the mix is? It's a combination. We look at the market, the competitive market for hotels um, as being quite quite widespread. So hotels like this one that's proposed, which ha that have large meeting facilities and or other spas or other services, food service, full service hotels uh, and entertainment, they, they would compete with hotels much further afield than some of your local hotels would. So hotels like the Gateway Delta, Gateway Property be, would be like that as well. Um, so we look at the competitors that is including properties like the Sheraton Guilford, like the Delta, like the Inn at Westminster Key, properties into you know Coco and Coquitlam, et cetera. And so um, hotels would compete with different, they would do, compete with different hotels depending on which market it is. So hotels that are gaming facilities and have entertainment would generally have much higher leisure percentage. The, uh, the mainstay of the hotels in Quitlam actually have a very, very high percentage of corporate business. Um, the hotels that are the gaming facilities and other entertainment, they have a much higher leisure and of course meeting facility uh, demand as well. So we, we combined all those numbers and looked at what that penetration would be um, within that whole region as opposed to just within Coquitlam. So, and, and also, as, as was mentioned, the room rate is projected to be much higher. So in fact, sometimes that's an option that it, it helps the other operators bring their rates up underneath that. That's what happened in Richmond where the room rate is very low because of all the air crew business. The rate for the whole market went up somewhat when, um, when, that, when the hotel was built. Thank you very much. I see no other questions yes. from council. Yes, Just one, one thing to, to answer, ahead. Councillor Nicholson, uh, sir. Uh, one thing was interesting. When we built River Rock, we're in a highly competitive uh, uh, Richmond area. Uh, the casino had been there in the past, but building this was an unknown. It was the first real resort of its kind. Uh, within the within the six years since we've been open, we just opened up uh, last week, last Monday, so we could go another hotel on that property uh, called the hotel at river rock resort with another almost 200 rooms and it's already having a high occupancy success on a soft opening and because there was supply and demand so there is a definite demand for the activities that we promote on our property and some of that is the property sells itself but there's a lot of, a lot there with regards to sales and, and bringing in the right groups and events and using our multi-purpose theaters that were 20 million dollars a piece uh, they are not just sitting there idle. They're there, and, and by adding on other convention facilities like we've done at River Rock, and I sh you're, she is correct, we say convention, really meeting and special event and, and things. We do trade shows, which could be con classified as conventions. Uh, this will be able to even uh, make our utilization of the Red Robinson Show Theater much greater than it already is, which has uh, been very successful. Thank you, Thank you very much. I see no other questions from Council. So we'll go straight to the rest of the pre-registered list. I assume that Mike Alivovic has already done that thing. Okay. Ken Woodward. Ends at 1466 Nanton Street. Good day. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Um, I come before you uh, just as a citizen who's lived in the Tri-Cities in Coquitlam for a long time and also been a business owner in Coquitlam. And um, I've been reading the paper and hearing in the community there's been some concerns about the application from some of the good folks uh, at the Best Western North Road. I'd like to say that I think that the Best Western Coquitlam Inn is a fantastic establishment. I think we have great people, great service. Uh, they're a great community leader, they're a great community participant, and they're a great business. But as a business, I don't think they should be coming in front of a council to perhaps argue a case against another business. I think 
businesses have to stand on their own. So with that said, I'd like to say that the casino has been a great uh, partner in our community, a great business, a great corporate citizen, a great leader. And everything that Howard said, I totally agree with. He, they've brought many, many things here. I think more will come, and I encourage you to pass it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Mr. Ron Little from Best Western Coquitlam with potentially an opposing point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I, I might mention to you to start off with that some uh, uh, adjoining municipalities offer a, uh, a, a fresh glass of water. Uh, I'm not sure if you've considered that or not. For each speaker, that is. I have a prepared text. Uh, my name is Ron Little. I'm the co-owner co of the Best Western Coquitlam Inn, which will celebrate its 30th anniversary in April 2012. We have approximately 50 on the room side and a similar number in food and beverage with approximately 300 seats. This is leased out and depends on guest room occupancy for survival. All of these staff are concerned about the future job if this application to build 180 rooms at the casino is approved. If the city were to allow this, they would be contributing to, contributing to an uneven playing field in that the casino could subsidize a lower room rate structure from casino in income, such as suggested with the alcohol in the report to council, and also uh, their subsidized food and beverage that they now subsidize, and uh, th they undertook that they would not do that uh, when they got their first 300 uh, slot machines. As you know, we cannot get a casino license under existing policies and therefore can't compete competitively compete. This could place existing properties at a considerable disadvantage, at risk, and conceivably put property tax bases in jeopardy. We are looking at a relatively small hotel market compared in Coquitlam compared to, say, Richmond, which has the airport and related businesses, and for that matter, Burnaby as a larger city with more industry. We would ask that Council turn down the casino's application for a hotel. They came to Council begging for the first 300 uh, units. At that time, they said there would be no hotel. I think we should hold them to their word. So we ask that members vote their conscience but not allow greed to take over at the expense of small business in the community. We ask that Council try to be fair to everyone, including small business. And I'll comment more on that later. Believe it or not, the city of Coquitlam can survive without ad added uh, casino income. Apparently, after a period of getting established, it is quite normal for a casino income to level off. And don't forget, the rest of, uh, uh, of us in the business community are still in a recessionary period. We would think that, that a casino, uh, who, why would we think that a casino would be affected any differently? To approve this application would be creating a precedent in that the city, not the applicant, would be creating the uneven playing field. This could definitely harm the future development of the city with respect to new hotels looking at Coquitlam as a future location. Right now, North American hotels are having severe difficulties, and this includes large chains, in raise, particularly in raising financing for hotels, and especially new locations. For the city to create an uneven playing field, it could make the difference between being able to attract a good hotel at city center or not, particularly in the present economic environment. This area is where a new convention center should be built at Coquitlam Center. According to two uh, senior uh, councillors, there has been some re recent interest shown by a national uh, hotel chain with regard to locating at or near Coquitlam Center. And I should mention that the city should be making it easier for business to operate so they can continue to create jobs and not throw another roadblock in their way. The first one being, of course, uh, the high tax level in Coquitlam. Well, what's next with this casino? Big box stores, another application to expand uh, uh, gambling, another hotel expansion. In actual fact, this formula is subsidizing from casino income 
They could expand this property in numerous directions, similar to what they did in Richmond. How about shopping facilities? I understand they can already include retail, so shopping centers should be on the alert. They can subsidize those as well. You can't compete. It's as simple as that. With subsidization taking place, they could put the restaurants, lounges, and entertainment facilities for the area pretty much out of business. They can undercut rates. They're doing it now, right now, in food and beverage. And they're doing it in Burnaby as well. The original intent was to create a quiet little casino out of the way on United Boulevard. That's when they had our support. But after they got the first 300 seats, that, uh, slot machines, that's the last we saw of them. And we, we went along with that because the distraction wouldn't affect the residential community. Now, it appears, we're looking at this as the center part of our community. And I stand here tonight in strong in disagreement with this application. Coquitlam residents didn't bargain for this, and this could very well become an election issue. The giant swath of consumer cash that leaves this community every month makes it difficult for small business to survive, particularly in a slow economy. They don't have casino income to subsidize them. The casino, casino already takes sufficient disposable cash from this community. If you lose money at the casino, you probably don't have much left to go out for dinner or a casual drink, or for that matter, to make purchases from local businesses. Personally, I would like to see the city establish and publish a policy that supports local business, supports one another. This is at the opposite end of the spectrum rather than creating an uneven playing field. Don't create this uneven playing field. The casino cannot do this on its own and it could come back to haunt council in the long term. Unfortunately, if council were to proceed with this, this would leave the city with a permanent blemish and one that would be impossible to eradicate. Professional lenders don't like to see an uneven playing field. For what it may be worth, council should know that in the U.S., the Republican Party is, start, is stating that a job building exercise is created by making sure that the energy sector has a level playing field. That's to create jobs, okay? In Coquitlam, we appear to be going in the opposite direction. As an alternative, we suggest the city reduce property taxes for businesses and make it more attractive for businesses to locate in Coquitlam. Increase the tax base by getting a healthier business environment. This in turn creates new jobs, healthy jobs that are good for the community. Back in the year 2000, I was told by a party who disliked casinos to just wait and see what happens when the casino gets everyone on the dole, including the city. The city will get everything, the casino will get everything that they want. I replied, really? Well, let's look at the actual record. We owe the casino absolutely nothing. They told us at the outset there would be no hotel. Please remember that we only get 10% of the profits for the city because it's part of the licensing agreement. They don't have any choice in this matter. It's nothing that they negotiate or are generous with. Mr. The city gets their funds from the BC Lottery Corporation. Mr. Little, you're going to, you're going to have to wrap up. Okay. Uh, or, you, or you can come back up. Um, unless okay. you know. I, I'd asked for eight minutes, and there was nothing said that I couldn't have the eight minutes. Certainly okay. the applicant had a lot more than five minutes. Okay. Typically we do allow enough, well, those questions of the applicant. There may be questions of you as well. I'll, I'll poll council. I don't know whether we want to... Okay, we're going to let you finish. They originally asked for 300 slot machines. Then it was in increased to 400 slots on a temporary basis. Then in 2004, it was increased to 1,000 slots with very little input from the public. According to BC Lottery, the city was obliged to advertise to the public that the slot machines would, were to grow from 450 to 1,000. This begs the question, do we have a legal casino? Since the public was not involved as, as they should have been. I believe we need a full investigation, perhaps by an independent party, and this should be dealt with prior to considering any further expansion at this time. I'm not certain uh, what the city is suggesting for their sports uh, tourism program is exactly a match for a full Las Vegas style casino hotel. 
A lot of sports involved young children. If we establish a full Las Vegas hotel and casino, this may not be the best atmosphere for young kids. As you know, the motto in Las Vegas is, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Is that really what we want in Coquitlam? I personally don't feel it's appropriate. We applaud council for proceeding with a much needed sports tourism strategy. Time will tell, future success will depend on how strong the commitment will be. Some would say the timing of this may be a little suspect a few weeks before the election. Has council checked with the applicant to make sure that they will accept sports groups? In the Richmond location, they are very, apparently very selective. If we are thinking the city should be run like a business, then let's have a forecast of guest room requirements that we needed as a result of this new strategy. To approve something in advance and knowing that there is a demand is simply unbusinesslike. First, you establish the demand and need, and then you consider building a hotel. Incidentally, if the city has had a professional study done, they may wish to share it with us. With an average rate, as suggested by the applicant, of $175 to $275, they're not going to be taking any sports groups. That's the truth of the matter. Yes, a new hotel would create jobs. However, it would also eliminate jobs as, as it is impossible to compete with a hotel that can subsidize the rate structure from casino income. The, the subsidization of food and beverage already exists in both Coquitlam and Burnaby casinos. With the loss of business, this would all put also put pressure on existing hotels' ability to pay the property taxes and in some cases, could put taxes in jeopardy. Is this really what the city of Coquitlam wishes to do? Is Coquitlam aware of how small business are, businesses are faring these days in this area? If not, perhaps they should find out. You don't increase the chances of small business surviving by the casino taking additional funds from the community. If after weighing the loss of local jobs, the city still feels they want to proceed to create a precedent setting uneven playing field by approving this application, then the casino should bring with them an application, with the application, a need. One that would help the current occupancy problem. A tourist attraction, such as a wax museum with three and a half million visitors per year, would qualify. The casino doesn't qualify based on performance over the last 10 years as a tourist attraction. I was taken aback by a staff report with respect to comments regarding the outcome of the neighborhood meeting. First of all, let me say that the meeting was conveniently arranged during school vacation, thereby limiting the number of people that could attend. However, that was a success successful format for the casino because they pulled it off on their application three years ago. Mr. Little, will you be much longer? You've been 12 minutes now, and I just wondered, you're much longer? I don't have it very much more, no. Okay. Uh, with respect to the neighborhood meeting, there were nine votes in favor and 27 against. The follow-up staff suggested, uh, suggested that, uh, staff comments suggested that 70% of the 27 were the, against the project were from Best Western and they were concerned about their jobs. Did the city qualify the nine that were in favor or was this comment put in simply to reduce the value of the Best Western staff for their legitimate concern? Let's face it. Overall, there was a negative response at the neighborhood meeting on the basis of three to one. And council in showing proper stewardship should take note of this. Now the city appears po uh, poised to approve an application that creates an uneven playing field and will, will put at risk the only remaining profitability part of the local hotel industry, namely the guest rooms. When I chaired another committee uh, dating back a few years, I had occasion to ask for a formal opinion on when somebody was in a conflict of interest position. And it was as follows. When somebody sitting on a committee or council make up, makes up their mind as to how they're going to vote prior to discussing the issue, which in this case is this meeting here tonight. However, I got a quote from the Coquitlam newspaper that reads, I will be pursuing having us address any issues before we approve the project. Looks as if it's already approved. Now, the casino has been very controversial over the years, and it appears we may have hit a bump in the road. The citizens of Coquitlam deserve an opportunity to express their opinion on this very important matter. The citizens of Coquitlam deserve the right to be treated fairly and to make up for what would appear to be a past oversight by the city of Coquitlam and not advertising the expansion of the number of slot machines, etc., 
we feel this issue should be resolved by way of referendum. As a result, the city of Coquitlam residents missed out on an opportunity to express their views on a very sensitive situation. A referendum can be done at any time, and since it is the casino that is initiating this application, the entire cost of this referendum should be paid for by the casino. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see a okay. question from a council member, Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, what, what amount of taxes do you pay on a yearly basis on your property? It's about 30,000 a month. 30,000 a month, so that's about 360,000 a year. Some, somewhere in that vicinity. I don't thank have you. it with me. Thank now. you very much. Any more questions? Thank you. I don't have any other. No. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, the next speaker is Harry Dollywall. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Harry Dollywall. I'm the manager of uh, Bel Air and Coquitlam Taxi. We are located at 2121 Hartley Avenue right next door to the Boulevard Casino. I have read the staff report and seen the plans and I'm here on behalf of Bel Air and Coquitlam Taxi to support the casino's uh, development project. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is John Wolfe. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, I'm here tonight as a taxpaying resident of Coquitlam and a business person in Coquitlam and would like to just make a few comments about the hotel proposal that's been put forward. Um, I'm in favor of this proposal and in favor of for a number of reasons. Uh, over the years that I've been involved in business in this community, I've continually heard and seen the need for additional and larger meeting and conference facilities, and this proposal will, will do that for us. It's all part of being able to encourage the economic growth and development of this city in this area. And uh, with this hotel proposal, I believe we can attract more major events. We can attract other organizations which will hold their um, corporate events in our community, uh, all of which will add to our growth in the community. I think it's also important because it's going to bring more people and more business into this community and we as taxpayers in this community have already invested a lot of money in developing and enhancing uh, various amenities throughout the community. And I think this is an opportunity to leverage those and uh, therefore I think it's important we do that. We have some very nice and high class facilities throughout this, this city um, and those were good investments that we made. So this is an opportunity to leverage that, take things to another level. And finally, I think there's, there's two things that are happening uh, over the next couple of years. One's already underway, and one is underway, I think. Um, that is the Portman Highway, uh, Portman Bridge Highway 1 project, and the Evergreen or Nevergreen Line project. Uh, both of those, I believe, are absolute game changers for this area <clears throat> and for this city. If I take a look at the Portman and Highway 1 project, that is going to really centralize us as a hub in the lower mainland, particularly on this side of the river, and all those businesses in the industrial park, uh, I believe are gonna benefit greatly from that, and therefore having additional facilities such as this whole hotel available to them is, is important. Um, we just have to look around us and see what is either already happening or has happened or is proposed to happen in some of the other adjacent communities where they're looking at doing these sorts of developments because they want to attract the business to their communities. So I think it's important that we not miss out on that. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Yep. Next speaker is Bob Lawler.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Bob Waller. I'm uh, manager of Go West RV Center on Fawcett Avenue. Um, Go West located to Coquitlam about six years ago from North Van. We run a fleet of about 200 rental RVs. In addition to that, we have uh, sales and service. Uh, Boulevard Casino has been a great partner of ours from a tourism standpoint. Uh, about 80% of our business comes from Europe, and there's a number of clients that come in the night before their rentals, uh, required places to stay. Uh, currently, a lot of those uh, stays are in Richmond. Um, also, on the return of their RV, they're looking for places to stay. A uh, facility of this kind of quality would definitely be of interest to uh, our clientele. Um, we re relocated to Coquitlam six years ago with the mind that the area was going to become more uh, diversified. Uh, we're happy to see a restaurant going in now, um, but we definitely welcome more diversification. Um, and um, a development like this can only help enhance our business and uh, full support from Go West RV. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alder. Okay, and that's the end of our list. And so we'll open the floor. Are there any other speakers to this item? Please step forward. Give your name and address for the record, please. Good evening, Your Worship and uh, Council members. My name is David Fantill. I'm uh, First Vice Chair of the Tri-Cities Chambers of Commerce. I'm here representing the Chamber and the Board. And uh, just want to start out by saying we support the application for a hotel in the Pacific Reach area of Coquitlam. Obviously, for many of the reasons that uh, were brought forth tonight, job creation. Um, some of you know the Chamber is a tourist info center for the Tri-City area, and we believe that's uh, going to bring in more tourism to our city. Um, we also, 25% uh, uh, of our uh, members, we have 800 plus members in the Tri-City Chamber, 25% of them are, uh, uh, have uh, employees uh, 35 and over. And speaking to, speaking to many of them, uh, they've uh, mentioned to me that they've had to leave our city and go to places like the Burnaby Villa or uh, the River Rock Casino to have larger facilities for conferences and trade shows. And um, by having, we believe, by having a bigger facility that's able to facilitate that will be a, a great economic activity and development for our city here in Coquitlam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Good evening, Your Worship and uh, Council Members. My name is Don Whiteman. I was, um, I was raised in Coquitlam my whole life and lived until just recently, uh, six months ago, I moved to uh, Port Moody. My business, I have a business. I'm a mechanical contractor in uh, uh, actually, just across Westwood and Davies, so I'm technically for Coquitlam, but I have a business license in uh, Coquitlam also. <clears throat> a couple of interesting comments that were made uh, tonight by Mr. Little and then by Mr. Blank. Mr. Blank made comment on how it would create more employment in the casino itself, but myself, I'm a mechanical contractor, so I thrive on uh, businesses being built in Coquitlam, which I can then uh, apply to an application to work for them for maintenance on their, uh, their equipment. I've applied for the city of Coquitlam. I've worked on the Evergreen Cultural Center for years. The, uh, some of the comments that Mr. Little made about <clears throat> the recession and the recession that we're in and how uh, it's, it's drawn back on all our economies is true, in fact. And so by the adding of a, a complex of this size into our city will create that much more employment for co companies like myself. I would apply to them to work on their equipment, and uh, I employ many uh, people that live in the city of Coquitlam, so it all becomes beneficial to my firm and, uh, and uh, residents of Coquitlam. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Good evening, Worship and Council. My name is Mark Petty, 3250 Carly Crescent. I'm a longtime resident of Coquitlam in the Tri Cities. <clears throat> I know many of you from my involvement in various events and sporting <clears throat> tournaments and things like that. I've also talked to you a lot of, uh, about the need for more um, hotel facilities. Um, I do agree with Mr. Little. <clears throat> when we do have tournaments within our community, especially kids' tournaments, they probably won't be going to Boulevard Casino to stay. 
But I'd also like to remind you of some of the other events that we have. We had the, you know, we've had police and firemen games. We've had um, um, the World uh, Lacrosse Championships. We had the under 21 soccer. I believe uh, Vancouver Golf Club is, is going to be hosting an LPGA event in the future. And also to deal with one of your comments, Councillor Nicholson. <clears throat> one of the things that's really bothered me is when we've had events or had uh, 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 tournaments, <clears throat> we end up having people going to other communities, Burnaby, the Sheraton Villa. We were sending people outside of our community to, to do it. I, I really appreciate what you've done as a council in developing the facilities, um, the sports tourism strategy. I think we've got lots of potential there. There's other um, the events that we do, cultural events. <clears throat> so if we can enhance that, if we can attract more back within our city, hopefully it will triple or trickle down to, to everybody else involved. I would hope that if we can retain some events and attract more events, that it'll benefit not only the Boulevard Casino facility, but also um, the other hotels, restaurants, and retail outlets that we have. So with that in mind, I definitely uh, support it, and I would encourage you to support the proposal also. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? The third and final time. Are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing none, I declare this item closed. That ends the public hearing agenda. And therefore, the public hearing is adjourned. Uh, we will move in a few minutes, in a couple of minutes, into a council meeting to consider items if council wishes uh, from tonight's agenda.